The following program is brought to you by Caltech. All right, thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the kinds of vehicles that we have in the past and we hope to in the future uh, used to explore Venus. Um, necessarily, then, this is going to be part history lesson and part technology talk um, with the intent to try to give you a feel for uh, both the magnitude of the challenge of exploring Venus um, and what some of the, the opportunities uh, might be going forward. So very briefly, I'll talk about the Venus environment. You heard a lot um, in Dave's talk earlier, but I'll try to give it a little bit of a spin in terms of what, it, what the implications are in terms of the kinds of vehicles you would use to, uh, to explore. Uh, a whirlwind uh, history of past missions to Venus. Um, and then I'm going to try to synthesize what I think are some of the key aspects of the Venus environment um, in terms of the kinds of vehicles that you might use to explore, whether it be orbiters, balloons, or landers. Um, and then wrap up with a little bit of what we think we know about the plans and possibilities for future missions. Um, so I think everyone pretty much knows everything on this, uh, on this chart, um, basic facts of Venus. Um, the key to put some numbers, people talk about how inhospitable the surface is. This is how it is, 460 Celsius temperature, 92 atmospheres pressure, um, complete cloud cover over the planet at all times. And that makes it a very challenging place to send vehicles to to, to take data. Um, most people have seen this kind of plot before of temperature and pressure as a function of altitude. So you get very high values of both pressure and temperature at the surface. Um, but it's important to note that by the time you get um, into the middle clouds, say around 55 kilometers, you have a surprisingly Earth-like environment where the temperature is close to what it is in this room. Um, the pressure is half an atmosphere. Um, it's not a coincidence that uh, the Russian Vega balloons picked that altitude to fly at. It allows you to port over um, technologies, particularly in electronics and materials, that we commonly use on Earth. Um, of course, the real kicker is that those clouds are primarily made of sulfuric acid, um, which poses a challenge, an engineering challenge, in terms of uh, having corrosion resistance in all the exposed parts of your vehicle that might be there. <clears throat> there are a very small number of pictures of the Venusian surface. Um, here's two of my favorites from uh, Venera 9 and 13. You see, and these are highly distorted images, um, not surprisingly, those landings were done in relatively flat and safe areas, um, but it looks, in some respects, surprisingly terrestrial uh, with rocks. Uh, it's just you can't last there for very long because it is extremely hot. Um, there are, and we heard in the talk earlier today, there are other terrain features on Venus that will not be quite so flat, and it's a real challenge um, to engineer vehicles that could safely land on much more fractured kinds of topography. So what are some of the challenges? So, um, you know, we're going to we're focusing really on three kinds of vehicles here. So there's orbiters, there's balloons, or you know, equivalently could be other kinds of aircraft flying, um, and then landers or you know, atmospheric probes that fall to the surface and then just happen to land. So some of the key things in each case, you know, orbiters you know, have, have to look through the clouds if they want to see anything on the surface. 
So radar is wonderful for that. Um, invisible wavelength cameras are not. Um, we heard a lot about the very slow planetary rotation uh, earlier today, um, which has interesting science implications, of course. Um, but it also makes for slow mapping of the surface, because if you're in orbit, the planet rotates very slowly underneath of you. It's not like you know, being at the Earth or the Mars, where in a relatively short time period, you can map the whole planet. Um, and Venus has you know, relatively strong gravity. So if you want to get into a low circular orbit, you're going to need a fairly substantial propulsion system. Um, or some combination of propulsion and the aerobraking technique. Um, as at least some of you know, the Magellan spacecraft you know, did the first real demonstration of aerobraking, which is to fly through the outer reaches of the atmosphere and use that drag to slow you down and to help circularize your orbit. Um, but these are engineering challenges that I think are pretty well understood for orbiters. Uh, in terms of balloons, um, as I mentioned, the real challenge is if you're going to float up in the clouds where the temperatures are more tolerable, uh, you've got to tolerate the sulfuric acid. Um, if you try going below and flying below the clouds, you quickly get into a temperature regime which exceeds that of what most instruments and electronics are designed to fly at. Um, so that's a challenge to payload survivability. One can always survive for a little while simply because it takes time. There's a thermal time constant to heat up payloads, and you can always insulate and put in heat sink materials to prolong your, your existence. Um, but if you want to go for days, weeks, months, uh, you need to be able to persistently tolerate these kinds of temperatures. And I'll say a few more words about the prospects for that in a little bit. Uh, for landers, you know, very hot, very high temperature, you, um, you, know, you essentially have to provide strong protection against both elements for any kind of landed asset. Um, that certainly has been the MO for previous missions, which essentially have put stuff inside of pressure ve insulated pressure vessels. And um, I think the world record is one of the Veneras lasted a little over two hours. So impressive, but you know, compared to the kinds of things we've become accustomed to doing you know, at Mars, it's uh, very limited. Um, and then I mentioned some terrain types would be more difficult to safely land on. And you know, the whole paradigm of having rovers that could drive around, um, you know, even if the terrain is flat, you would need a system that could you know, live at that kind of temperature, which is not easy. Um, there have been a lot of missions to Venus, um, just not a lot recently. So it was an obvious target when the space age got underway, um, simply because it was the closest planet and so little was known. So by my count, there's been 23 robotic missions to Venus. So I think it'll be up on the website. I've got a summary table, eye chart for now, so I won't dwell on it. Um, but lots of, lots of missions, um, mostly long ago. So relatively few missions in you know, the last 20 years or so. Um, well, why did they stop? It was largely political. So most of those missions were from the Soviet Union. Um, Soviet Union is no more, and their planetary exploration program basically came to a halt. Um, and then Mars uh, has received arguably more than its fair share of attention in recent decades um, and has had, you know, obviously a tremendous string of spectacular successes. Um, but in the sense that, uh, you know, you keep putting your money on a winning horse, um, you know, it has taken uh, a lot of resources that could have gone to Venus. Gone to Venus. This last bullet is somewhat editorialized, but um, we've had a lot of missions to Venus, and in some sense, the easy stuff's been done, and it wasn't very easy to begin with. And so increasingly, the kinds of things that 
we would like to do, like measuring seismicity on Venus, is very hard because of the significant environmental challenges. Um, and that takes um, not only new technology, but significant financial resources um, that mostly have not been available in recent years. So I'm going to just show you some pictures now of what some of these past vehicles have looked like. Um, you know, the very first interplanetary spacecraft, Mariner 2, a couple hundred kilograms. Um, the Russians or the Soviets did things in a very big way, so you had 1,000 kilogram plus vehicles that um, went to Venus with the early Veneras. Pioneer Venus Multiprobe was the U.S. mission in the late 70s, which had one large and three small atmospheric probes that entered more or less simultaneously into the Venusian atmosphere. Um, they were you know, small vehicles compared to the very large Russian vehicles. You see the spherical uh, part of the structure here is the pressure vessel landing on um, you know, some sort of you know, landing ring. And then this helical array here uh, was the radio. Um, I guess the last lander at Venus was Vega. You know, again, close to a metric ton, large pressure vessel, you know, the same standard design with the antenna on top and instruments in the landing ring down below. Uh, the Vega mission was actually a combination lander and balloon. So it had a smallish balloon. This was three and a half meters in diameter and carried a seven kilogram payload, which was essentially a MET package. Um, so it had temperature and pressure measurements and the radio transmission could be tracked from the earth and allowed for measurement of the winds because the balloon would move with the winds and it serves as a tracer in that sense. Uh, Magellan um, was a very successful, very large vehicle that did uh, synthetic aperture radar maps of Venus. And I think most of you have seen these wonderful false color images, um, you know, peering through the clouds and revealing the <coughs> tremendous uh, diversity and complexity of features on the Venusian surface. There is only one vehicle that's currently operational at Venus right now, and that's the European uh, Venus Express mission, um, which has been almost a decade uh, uh, operational. Um, so this was a, an adaptation of their Mars Express orbiter um, that has been in uh, uh, orbit at Venus for a long time. Um, you know, it's done extensive mapping of the upper atmosphere winds, um, you know, a lot of detailed mapping of the cloud structure, um, did measurements to, you know, essentially confirm that, you know, there's lots of lightning on Venus, um, and did the first large-scale temperature maps of the southern hemisphere surface. Um, so I think Venus Express is coming to the end of its life. I'm not sure what the current plans are, but I think through the end of this year. Through the end of this year. Um, so a tremendously successful mission, um, but it's not going to be there for very much longer. The Japanese space agency um, sent the Akat Akatsuki spacecraft to Venus. Um, unfortunately, the main propulsion system failed when they tried to enter orbit in late 2010. Um, so the spacecraft has been flying. Um, you know, it missed Venus, but it's essentially in orbit around the sun. And there are actually plans to try and salvage the mission. Um, so they don't have a main propulsion system, but they do have the attitude control thrusters, much smaller. And they have a plan when they come back to Venus next year um, to try to sneak their way into orbit with some very painstakingly figured out plans for um, you know, slowly getting captured and then getting into an orbit that can be useful. Um, I'm not nearly close enough to handicap the chances of success, but I can certainly applaud, applaud their determination to try to get there and to make it work. Um, but this is currently the only 
possible mission that, you know, will get to Venus at the end of Venus Express. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing else that is approved and is under construction at this time. Um, although I will say a few words a little bit later about what some of the thinking is about what future missions could be. So with that very brief history in mind, I'm going to say a few words then about, you know, from an implementation and an engineering point of view, what are some of the things we want to keep in mind? So I've touched on some of this as I, I went through the previous chart, but with a view towards being able to make seismic or, you know, other measurements, what do you, what do you need to know? What do you want to keep in the back of your mind about engineering of these kinds of vehicles. Um, the orbiter story is pretty simple. I mean, we know how to do orbiters. Um, you know, there's no real technology challenge. I mean, you just have to engineer it properly. Um, you're closer to the sun, um, which poses a different thermal challenge compared to Earth or Mars or outer planets, but we know how to do that. Clearly, we've been able to send very large orbiters. Um, you know, it's really just limited by the size of the launch vehicle. And Venus is basically the easiest place to get to. Lots of solar power, so if you need to consume large amounts of energy for a big radar instrument or anything else, you can do it. Um, the orbiters to date have really utilized these highly elliptical orbits to minimize the propulsion uh, system that they need to get in. Um, but Magellan, you know, did aerobraking, you know, several Mars orbiters have done Mars aerobraking since then. Um, so there's no reason why you couldn't use this technique to get into basically whatever orbit you want in Venus. So the orbiter story is pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> the balloon story is, is a little more complicated. Um, and since I'm a balloon guy, I'm I'm going to indulge a couple of charts to tell you a little bit about Venus balloons and the different kinds um, and try to uh, put the Vega balloon experience into some context. Um, so balloons have been flying on Earth for a couple of centuries, and there's many different kinds, uh, most of which you can adapt to Venus. Um, so to give you a sort of whirlwind tour, the Vega balloon was a pressurized balloon known as a superpressure balloon. So it was helium filled. And this kind of balloon is inherently stable to perturbations that try to move you away from your nominal uh, flying altitude. Um, if you don't have a pressurized balloon, so-called zero pressure balloon, basically it's just a vented balloon, most terrestrial scientific balloons are of this kind. Um, they can be very large. Some of you may know that they can fly, you know, multi-ton payloads up into the stratosphere. Truly impressive structures. Um, if you need to maintain altitude, though, you have to do ballasting and gas venting in order to actively control your altitude. Um, you can do that at Venus as well. Uh, weather balloons are ubiquitous on Earth. Uh, there's hot air balloons, both for, mostly for sport and advertising. And then if you want to get really adventurous, you can put motors on your balloon and you know, have a, a blimp where you can basically fly where you want to go. In principle, all of these could work for Venus. Um, but as I said, the Vega balloons you know, were super pressure balloons. And typically, if you want long lifetime, you would like this kind of pressurized balloon because of its altitude stability. And in fact, terrestrially, uh, I think the world record was there was a stratospheric pressurized balloon on Earth that flew for 740 days, um, you know, many decades ago. Um, so if long life is important, that's the way you'd like to go. Uh, because of the sulfuric acid clouds, though, if you're going to fly in the clouds, you basically want to Teflon coat your balloon. Um, the Vega balloons used a, a kind of Teflon to make their balloon out of. Um, and then whatever payload you have, you're going to want to keep the sulfuric acid away in some sort of protected compartment and you know, make that compartment Teflon coated as well. Um, a little 
um, advertisement for a balloon that we've been developing at JPL for Venus. Um, you see here one of our early prototypes, five and a half meters in diameter. Um, so this has been designed to fly in the clouds at the Vega-like altitudes, but to do it for a much longer period of time and to carry, you know, many tens to 100 kilograms of payload so that you can do the kinds of measurements that, you know, the small Vega balloon was unable to do. Um, so we're in the process of building a larger balloon, and you can see the kind of metrics compared to the Vega balloon, which, you know, really was more like a weather balloon in its capabilities. Um, so we hope to finish our prototype this summer and actually do a flight test at the end of the summer which would be a lot of fun. I'll just point out that the silvery shape, the Vega balloon was white, and it was mostly designed just to fly at night. And um, it worked wonderfully well, flew for two days, um, and then as designed, the batteries ran out of power and the transmitter stopped. They, we don't actually know how long those balloons survived. But a priori, they were not designed to really fly in the full of Venusian uh, sunlight. Um, this balloon, because we have this very reflective aluminum layer underneath the Teflon, uh, it'll mitigate the heating of the balloon, and it is designed to fly in the worst case Venus solar environment. Let me just say a word about balloon payload. So, you're often going to hear this term gondola, um, which is really adapted from the compartment that people ride in on a balloon gondola on, you know, on a hot air balloon. Um, but whether you call it gondola or payload compartment, you know, that's, that's where the payoff is. And on Earth, you know, the, the payloads can range from, you know, 100 gram MET packages, you know, all the way up to these, you know, multi-ton payloads for large astrophysical missions. And so here's an example of uh, the, the CREAM experiment from 2005, which um, you know, NASA and the University of Maryland launched out of Antarctica. And you know, this thing is gigantic. You see the solar cells to give it power. Uh, this thing flew for about a month. And NASA typically flies three such payloads a year out of Antarctica. Um, so this is well understood. For a Venus space mission, much like terrestrially, the gondola has to house all of the required spacecraft elements that you need to explore. So of course, the science instruments, it's got to have a telecom system, whatever command and data handling electronics, electrical power, generation and distribution, the support structure, and the thermal control. So it's much like a spacecraft that just happens to be flying in the atmosphere. If you have more sophisticated balloons that, you know, are like blimps that have propellers or other things that allow them to direct their travel, um, then you add, you know, propulsion and guidance and control systems. Um, and then you're really like a spacecraft with the complete functionality. Um, most of our thinking, and certainly the JPL balloon, is not this kind of balloon. It would not have propulsion. It'll go where the winds take us, and you can still do amazing things with such a vehicle. For Venus landers, as I've mentioned, all probes and landers to date have used insulated pressure vessels to protect the payload from the environment. So these are, I think, to date, they've all been spherical because the spherical shape is structurally the most efficient shape to withstand the buckling loads. Um, but in principle, I mean, you could make it cylindrical as well if you wanted to. Um, so some of the features, you know, are well illustrated on the Venera lander. I've talked about the landing ring. Because the Venusian atmosphere is so dense, um, the Venera has landed without a parachute. They had this, what they call a drag plate, which was just something to slow it down a little bit more than the vehicle otherwise would have. But you get landing uh, speeds on the order of several meters per second. So it's not like 
Mars where you need rockets or airbags or other things to cushion your landing. Um, a little bit of crush pad. I mean, you almost can't fail to land safely at Venus. I mean, the real trick is if there's sharp rocks and things you might tip over and that's bad for another reason. But um, you're not going to typically end up landing and shattering into a lot of pieces on Venus because of the thick atmosphere. Um, as I also mentioned, survival lifetimes have been very short to date. They've been passively uh, thermally controlled vehicles, so they're heating up, and you just try to make the heating up as slow as possible so that you can take as much data as you can while you're there. Um, people at JPL and elsewhere have looked at you know, well, how good could you do if you take the basic Venera approach and, you know, get new and improved insulation, um, new kinds of heat sink materials? Um, and I think we generally conclude that you might be able to get up to a day of life. I mean, that's still an order of magnitude better than the best of the Veneras. Um, but if you, but this technique is not going to get you weeks or months. And if you need weeks or months for seismology, then what are you going to do? So I would argue there's only two options. Um, you either have to, you need active refrigeration, where you have so little sunlight on the surface that long term, some kind of nuclear powered refrigeration is your only option. So then you could go with, you could have a compartment that is kept it close to room temperature, and you can use existing instruments and electronics. The alternative is no refrigeration. You develop electronic payloads and instruments that can live off the land. Um, neither of these really exist. So there's lots of conceptual designs for how you could do a nuclear-powered refrigeration system, but it's hard and it's going to be expensive, it's not funded, and there are even, you know, within the last month, uh, indications that, you know, the U.S. ability to provide the plutonium needed to power such a thing, um, it's just not going to be there for any foreseeable time frame. Now, high temperature electronics have, have had a lot of work done, and my friend and colleague Mohammed Mojarati is really the expert on this, and I hope you'll get a chance to speak to this sometime during the workshop. Um, but progress has been made there. And so let me just say a word or two of introduction, and then you'll get the real story from Mohammed. I think Yeti Honda also has a good point. A fair point. So between the two of you, you will correct my mistakes. Um, so you can do some things. The Venera missions actually had some uh, rudimentary high temperature drills that got material, brought it into the pressure vessel. And NASA has been working on such things. Um, you know, maybe Gary will get a chance later this week to talk about uh, the work they're doing on high temperature seismometers. Um, in terms of electronics, um, there are actually are some discrete components that can get up to the right temperature you need that exploit, you know, wide band gap semiconductors such as silicon carbide or gallium nitride. Um, vacuum tubes actually can work quite well at Venus uh, in kind of a back to the future uh, motif. Um, so there's, there's bits and pieces here. What, what you don't have is the full spectrum of electronics that would let you you know, make computers and, you know, store data um, and the kinds of complete functionality we've come to expect with, you know, full spacecraft. Um, so I think I'm going to skip over this because Gary and Mohammed will speak to this in more detail later, but they'll tell you about some of the work that's been going on. And it's, I think, important also to point out that, um, even if you can't get all the way to Venus surface temperatures, surface temperatures, if you can get part of the way, I think you can still prolong your lifetime. 
Okay, so there's going to be a trade-off of lifetime at Venus versus the temperature at which you can operate your components. Um, and amongst other things, that will be an interesting trade if you want to do things from balloons because altitude and temperature are directly connected, of course. So if you want to get closer to the surface, you need to go up in temperature. And so intermediate functionality could be important for some of those concepts. So what's the future hold? Let me just wrap up with a handful of last charts here. Um, five years ago, uh, I actually uh, helped lead a NASA-sponsored study that involved a number of institutions, uh, both inside and outside of NASA, that tried to scope out a flagship mission, you know, a big mission, kind of a Christmas tree that tried to do an awful lot. Um, and it, it tried to combine in one mission a long-lived orbiter, a couple of instrumented balloons, and a couple of short-duration landers. Um, so we had essentially a, a reference mission, and we tried to put some numbers on how big it would be, what the masses were, the kinds of you know, nominal uh, scientific payloads that could be taken. Um, and then we also examined some new technologies that we identified that with appropriate care and nurturing uh, could become available for flight and what that might do to enhance the kind of mission you would otherwise do with existing technology. Um, so NASA took this report, said thank you very much, um, said we don't have the, I don't know, $3 billion needed to go and fly it. Um, one of the interesting things was it was never implemented, but um, some of the ideas from that have uh, diffused their way throughout the community. And you see bits and pieces of these popping up in Discovery and New Frontiers mission proposals, for example. Um, so there is a, a report that's available on the internet that you can download and read in copious detail what that was about. I think as most of you know, um, every decade NASA commissions a strategic planning uh, document uh, from a science perspective called the Decadal Survey. And the most recent one, and we're just starting the decade that it, it covers, uh, talked about two important Venus missions that it identified as priorities. One is a Venus, Venus climate mission. Um, which essentially would be an instrumented gondola carried by a balloon backed up with some probes and a relay orbiter. So this is in what they called the mini flagship category. Um, so this happened to be, I think, number four or five in their priority list, which is not high enough to get immediate attention. Um, but you can see some of the echoes of the Venus flagship study. Um, and then there's a mission called uh, Venus in Situ Explorer, which is really part of the competitive program uh, that NASA runs called the New Frontiers Program. Um, and as currently imagined, that's a single lander in a Venera-style uh, kind of short mission. Um, so VCM is, is going to be deferred because, frankly, NASA doesn't have enough money to do it sooner. And the expectation is one or more uh, institutions will propose their version of VICE um, at the next NASA New Frontiers uh, program opportunity, which I think is still probably a couple of years off. The uh, Russians, uh, for a few years now, have been kicking around a uh, return to Venus mission concept known as Venera D. Um, again, it, it has a lot of the flavor of the NASA strategic thinking in that it tries to combine an orbiter and a lander, um, some ideas of a long living station, a different kind of lander, um, looking at microsatellites, looking at adding balloons. So this is, I think, in the conceptual design phase Inevitably, it takes on the Christmas tree 
aspects where everyone would like to pile on. Um, NASA had stood up a science and technology definition team uh, to try to collaborate on the Russian effort. Um, it got about two months in, and then the political uh, problems uh, with the Ukraine and Crimea uh, led to a <laughs> dictate from NASA that we stop talking to the Russian Space Agency. So that effort is just completely stalled right now. Um, so one can only hope that the politics will clear up soon and we can get back to business. But I'm not holding my breath. I mentioned in passing, you know, NASA has a discovery program. Uh, there is actually a call on the street expected maybe any day now for uh, the draft AO for the next discovery mission. Um, and then ESA has their so-called M-class opportunities, which are very analogous. These are missions on the order of four or five hundred million dollar price tag, where anyone who wants to can, you know, submit a proposal and convince NASA that you should get the money to go and do your complete space mission. Um, upcoming, so, you know, very near term this year, uh, we're expecting the NASA discovery call. And surely there will be five or more, dis, you know, Venus proposals submitted by different NASA centers and other institutions. Uh, I think there will be an ESA M-class call later this year. Um, these have happened before. There have been lots of submissions to the Discovery Program and ESA's M, uh, Cosmic Visions Program. Um, Venus has never been picked. Not even once. Uh, and I believe the last opportunity three, maybe four years ago, um, there were, I think, seven Venus proposals that spanned the complete range of orbiters, balloons, and some descent probe missions. Um, so putting it mildly, I think the Venus science community believes that a discovery selection is long overdue. Um, and we, you know, many of us have been working hard to lay the groundwork for a successful proposal. Um, so we'll see if we can finally break through. Um, I guess the, at the last word, the Europeans are going to focus their efforts on a Venus orbiter concept uh, the next time around, although I know in the past they have proposed Venus balloon missions as well. All right. I'm going to wrap up on time with one concluding slide. Um, so we've been to Venus. We know how to do it. It's not easy. Um, but we'll surely go back sometime uh, with all of these vehicles. What comes next probably will determine or be determined by whatever selection gets made through you know, to the Discovery or, or ESA M-Class competitions. Um, it is not an easy place to go to, and we've dwelled at length on why that is. Um, if, you know, the orbit, orbiters are not too bad, but if you want to go in situ, it is a hard place. Um, there is technology that is uh, existing that can make for some very good competed mission proposals. Um, but you'd sure like to get new technology because, you know, persistent deep atmosphere surface missions, I didn't talk much about this, but there's altitude cycling balloons, airplanes and gliders. I mean, a lot of variety of in situ kinds of vehicles that would make wonderful platforms uh, that we just can't quite do yet because the technology is not completely matured. So I think with that, I will stop and I will take questions. Thanks for your time.